gonna gaze off and I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Back with another lifestyle chat with my friend Jordan. Hi. Jordan was Miss Black Georgia. I don't know any of the years for these things. Yes, yeah, at the women's show, you said Miss Savannah State, you're wrong. And I was just like, that's small. Oh, you said 2012, well, it's 2010, 2011, Miss Savannah State. Oh, uh -huh. well, Miss Savannah <laughs> State 2012? Christelle. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, oh, she, yeah. she was Miss Savannah State. <laughs> Um, Miss Black Georgia. She was the director of the Miss Black Georgia. Was that South Carolina and mm -mm, just, or just, just Georgia? Georgia. Mm -hmm. She owns a etiquette business, Impressum School of Social Graces. Impressum School of Social Graces. She's a mom. Um, and if we get some interruptions, that's because <laughs> she's a mom. <laughs> she's here. Speaking of Impressum School of Social Graces, we're gonna talk about confidence and self-esteem today. I think for me, it was something that I've always struggled with and because I'm in fashion and styling, people don't really realize that. <laughs> and so people don't necessarily believe that I've had issues with confidence and esteem and whatnot. And that's kind of how I got into styling. I didn't get into styling because it's I was good at it. It mm -hmm. kind of like morphed as I got more into doing that. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, the beat program mm -hmm. um, when at Savannah State. Mm -hmm. I that's how I ended up getting the corporate America through the National Urban League, the Black Executive Exchange Program. Mm -hmm. There was a conference, and we got sponsored by Cigna, mm -hmm. but okay. I ended up being like recruited by UPS and one of the executives there, I remember I was in the room kind of, I guess, going back. When I got to Savannah State, I had just left a very troubling past mm -hmm. at yes. another PWI. Uh -huh. And I just, I had the time of my life. So by the time I got to Savannah State, like my GPA was shot. I was trying to rebuild it, but within the Black Executive Exchange Program, like that conference, mm -hmm. like you're with the cream of the crop of students across a bunch of different HBCUs. <laughs> Insert here, if you hear a little kid thing going, it's, we gotta entertain the child some way. <laughs> okay, the students were so cream of the crop, even the students from Savannah State that mm -hmm. came from the business department, I didn't feel like I could compete with them students and being in a room with them. Like I didn't feel like I deserved to be there. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was, it had to be like 300 students there. Mm -hmm. I went in the bathroom and I broke down. Oh I was just sobbing. <laughs> and you know I'm a crybaby. I was sobbing. But there was a woman there. She is still with UPS. I still follow her on LinkedIn. I still pop in. Her name was Tracy. She said that I was a breath of fresh air. Hmm. I guess different from the people who were from like from the people that were there. Mm -hmm. Like these are Suma and Magnum Cum Laude's and it was just like I ain't got all that. What are you doing? <laughs> no, no, no. You're fine over there. And it kind of really put me in a better headspace at least back then and I'm not gonna date myself, but that was a while ago. Mm -hmm. On even having to believe in yourself mm -hmm. and believe that you're worthy of being in a room with other people. A lot went through my head as you were saying that, like going back to college and even where I am now, there are a lot of things that I've been through that, that have made me who I am, of course, and that I realize have happened for a purpose. And even, so, so back to Savannah State, I never would have thought that my college experience would have been what it was because of how grade school was. I, I, okay, elementary, I had friends. Mm -hmm. Middle school was really hard. Mm -hmm. I had bad skin. Um, somebody told me I was the ugliest girl in the class. Those middle school were the days I would go home and cry. Oh no. Yes, and it was just like, uh, it was never bad, like, I don't wanna be here anymore. It wasn't like, you know, suicidal thoughts or anything. It was just like, I wanna feel better. I feel like I always knew who I was, but I wanted to like who I was better. And that was a part of puberty. That was a part of growing up. And I always, there was always like a, a twinkling of faith, that mustard seed of faith that made me believe it was gonna get better. And I remember um, changing from bottle, clap bottle cap glasses. You had glasses. To contact, I have contacts now. I, I had glasses. Let me yeah. think about this. 
I don't think I ever seen you. High school, before. early high school. Were you a teen peer counselor? No. No. And nothing okay. until, until yeah. I got to Savannah State. High school was good. I went to predominantly white high school, Savannah Arts, and I believe it equipped me to be successful at an HBCU. It, it helped my speech. Uh, I was one of the people that was told I talked white and I didn't know what that meant. I, I heard, heard that and I mean, I went to Windsor. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I cared. <laughs> I didn't care. I, I heard it from my family. Like, you know, people will say all the time that we don't sound like we're from Savannah mm, or yes, we're from the South. That's like, I got my people on the East and the West side of Savannah. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you had the school. <laughs> I had the neighborhood right. that I had to learn how to fluctuate between. <laughs> and it was, no, I didn't learn that in school. But, and even being in those totality of those different environments is how I got to where I was. Like. And it's not that I didn't care what people thought about me. I did care, but it was like internally. Like mm -hmm. I never like outwardly like expressed it or like went off on anyone like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just kind of made me timid mm -hmm. and shy. And I didn't really break out of it until probably maybe my junior or senior year at Spanish College. Uh, you were, you were, you had a shell. You had a shell and I'm so proud of how you Blossom. I'm like, this girl is confident. She's unapologetic and um, fearless or seemingly fearless. I know you still as an entrepreneur have those moments where it's like, I know I don't want to bring, it's recent. You said you had, you shared it on social media. You had a oh, day yeah. the other day where you just cried. Oh, yes. And I was like, yeah, it's one of those entrepreneurship days. I don't know what's next. And that's normal. Believing it's normal is a part of what makes you feel like, okay, that was a good cry. Mm -hmm. I'm done with it. It's a release. Because I need we don't that. It's okay. it. Yeah. You mentioned being a loner. And I think that, I, I don't know if I ever tried to um, believe there would be a clique or a group of friends for me to fit into. But in high school, I had an encounter with a group of about three... There were not many black girls at Savannah State. I mean, at Savannah Arts. There were not many black girls at Savannah Arts, but I had an encounter with a group of about three other black girls, and it was pivotal. It, it was pivotal because I went from having a group of black girls that I hung with at Savannah Arts to learning to have to be okay with hanging by myself. I'll never forget how I realized when I got to Savannah, Savannah State that not be dependent on being a part of any group because where I was going, I wasn't gonna have, not the time, but I wasn't gonna have the time to care you about so many have to be able to carry them and care enough about what they were saying about what you were doing. Exactly. If they were gonna be discounting where you were back then, I've been. I just wanna make sure you're good. We don't have to be friends ever again like we were before, but I just wanna make sure you're good. And that's a lot of the conversations that need to happen that never do. Yeah. Those are the apologies that, um, you have to be okay with never getting yeah. that we talk about on social media. I was talking with my sister like two days ago, and now I'm getting into talking about caring about what people think. Mm -hmm. Chris Cuomo, the journalist reporter, was interviewing his brother, who's the governor of New York, mm -hmm. his older brother. And I, was, I mentioned how he seemed nervous talking to his brother and how that was like me talking to my older sister. And it wasn't, she was like, well, is it nerves? Is it is it being fearful? Or is it out of respect or reverence that you have that type of demeanor? Mm -hmm. I said, it's out of respect or reverence because I, I care about what you think when I'm talking to you, because you're my big sister. And I know that you're gonna get me right together if I say anything wrong, if I do anything wrong, that's the kind of relationship we have. So then we got to talking about caring what other people think. And she said, I never saw you like that. I never saw you caring what me or mama or daddy thought. And I told her, I think I care too much. It's not so much kept me from doing what I wanted to do because that's the other point she made. She said, I never thought you cared about what we thought because you always, we tell you something and you always do what you want to do anyway. Okay. I was like, like well, said, that is <laughs> reverence. I do the same thing. When you're talking I'm to gonna me. seek out counsel and mm -hmm. I, I care about what you think but just because I care about what you think is not going to influence the path of what I want to do and where I'm going. Yeah, I I'm gonna, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I remember like my pastor, because I was at a point when I had left Atlanta and mm -hmm. I had come back to live with my parents. And it was just like, I was just so used to being on my own and I did not want to rely on them in the sense of what I did because I left a great paying job. I left my apartment and I left a lifestyle of being single and mm -hmm. having to come, yeah, an independence and having to come and stay with my parents. And it was 
just a shift and it was just like well I still have to respect them mm -hmm. and even in that sense it was just like like even that dynamic changed our relationship um because when I left now my dad's at the very very tip of the baby boomer spectrum <laughs> my mom is right after that i think that's a gen x i think but whatever <laughs> is after the baby boomer like uh -huh. they're like five years apart so like my dad is at the end of the baby boomer mm -hmm. so like and i'm a millennial so right. it's just like, like our work ethic are we millennials is or <laughs> completely yeah. different Although I grew up in the house with them and I definitely have their work ethic when, you know, when it comes to, I got to eat, I got to hustle, I got to get yes. this. But millennials, we tend to be like, okay, well, entitlement. I would say, yes, it's a sense of entitlement, but it's like, I'm going to figure this out on my own. I don't need to have put like 30 years in on a job somewhere. Right. So I think in that sense, like I... I, when I went into working where I did work in Atlanta, mm -hmm. I was like, I was gonna, I had the trajectory of like, oh, I'm gonna work in the operations and I'm gonna move to corporate. And I had a whole path laid out because like, when I came home and I had to figure out stuff and what, not only what made me happy, but where my purpose was leading me, mm -hmm. it was completely different. And did that what, like shoot your self esteem down? It. It was humbling. It was, oh, Jesus, you talk about humbling. Mm -hmm. Humbling has been the word of the year in 2016, 17, and I would say 19. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, it was very humbling to say the least. And I mean humbling because, you know, you're relying on your parents. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, especially at, at our age. Like, you don't want to be relying on them for certain things. Mm -hmm. It was because I, I'm going to follow what I want to do. And I was in a good place, um, but I didn't have any attachments to where if I can make certain moves, I could do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a spouse or kids or anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a house that I had to worry about, mm -hmm. like being on the market. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to move a certain way, I could. Um, whereas their experience was completely different. Right. Like by the time she was like my age, she had two kids and we were we were almost in middle school. Mm -hmm. And so, and like, you know, they were married trying to figure things out as a young married couple. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, our experiences looked completely different. And I think where the the reverence that I was trying to give to them while also being respectful to what I wanted to do is where the shift happened. Mm -hmm. Cause it was like, I can't be asking for help. And then I want to go off and do my own thing. But what we had to do was we had <laughs> to figure out the balance of how that, of what that looks like. It took a lot of educating. Mm -hmm. And I would say my parents didn't under, my, especially my daddy. My daddy has questioned every decision that I have made. <laughs> Over the last five years, I've quit my job, multiple jobs mm -hmm. that I've quit. But it was just like until like they started actually seeing the fruits mm -hmm. of the seeds that I had been sowing, like you know, and the styling and the covers mm -hmm. and all the shoots. It's like okay, she may actually know what I'm talking, what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, what you I didn't understand, I don't understand why I had to prove it. Because I'm just like, you raised, raised me. me. Yes. Why don't you trust? So why don't you trust me? Oh my gosh, and even yeah, speaking of that yeah. and going into relationships real quick, I remember for some reason, cause like I'm I'm single more than I've been in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Especially well, especially the last few years mm -hmm. I have been. And like my dad, I don't know. Yeah. But I think it was I think I was dating Michael. Wow. But I yeah, he was white. Oh, I didn't know. Jewish. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. He was a, an awesome guy, but I remember like my daddy was like questioning like my decisions. And I'm just like, pause, fam. Uh, like, come on, like, come on. It's me. You share that with your friends, and they're like, oh, they just care. Your parents care so much, and it's, and it's, it's, it's honestly, it's care, it's concern, it's worry too. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah, it's definitely there. work because, like, again, it looked so different from what they were accustomed to. Like, this was somebody that did not look like me. We did not have the same faith. Not putting into so, consideration that they've had their moments of, um, our parents have all had their moments of ex exploration. Ex telling. <laughs> and curiosity. And they may not talk about it, but they have. Oh, we know. But yeah, and it was just like, even that, like I wouldn't even say that even knocked my esteem as much as my confidence. And I'm just like, you have to be confident and who you raise and knowing that I'm gonna make the best decisions that I possibly can for where I am, 
my experiences have looked different from yours mm -hmm. and it's taken us in different places and you have to you have to be okay with that mm -hmm. speaking of relationships no i know everybody's gonna about to sit on the edge of their seat because i barely talked about it and every time i and everybody's been so respectful not to ask and i feel like because people know but then anywho oh, okay, inspired you're about what you have your, to say your, i'm recently divorced, divorced okay. and when with my prodigal daughter return it was like Almost like an I told you so, but I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. It was like I knew better. You talk about humility and your self-esteem. I would say 2019 was a year of manifestation. It was a year of me actually getting back to me. I, and look, I had a million words to explain it before and I've been silent about it for so long. When I left my situation, there was like no, it wasn't, I don't know if I can, I'm not trying to explain, uh, compare it to anyone else's mm -hmm. situation, but there was no, it didn't hurt like some people would think every divorce hurts. It was more mm -hmm. like freeing. It was more like, it was like a purge, but it was more like, I would say that a part of it was my disobedience. The people who loved me the most and who really knew Jordan, had my back mm -hmm. and and were guiding me and because I knew better and because I knew that um, there was forewarning when it was time to realize that it was time to cut it it was like okay this I is think what I'm supposed to do got grace on it <laughs> like it makes it easier yeah like I've had been in a similar situation in a relationship to where there was no grace to move forward on the situation hmm. And so it could not go forward. And I think because I was spiritually obedient in that I knew that I wasn't going to disobey the Lord again because mm -hmm. I had done that, mm -hmm. that it was just like once I recognized there was no grace to move forward with that person, yeah. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going down that road again because the first time that happened, it was I was just so lost and I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want to wake up. And it took a good nine months mm -hmm. to get up out and out of that thing. Like laboring and breaking and the baby. And so, <laughs> yes. And it was just like, I couldn't even like move forward with anyone or anybody. I was single for like three years. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And it was like, I had to use all that time afterwards to figure out who I was. And that's, you know, when the whole, that's even like within that, how Sheree Styles came mm -hmm. up out of everything, just trying to figure out who I was and and everything else. Yeah. I I keep saying there was never a point where I didn't know who I was. I always had these internal conversations with myself, asking myself, what are you doing? Why are you in a situation where you're not being treated like the queen that you are? Jordan, what are you? all these conversations. I realized that I disobeyed you because I heard you when I was engaged and you said, don't do it. And I did it anyway, because I figured I saved myself for marriage. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what you want us to do. So I'm doing it right. So just cover me as I go through this and, and do what I want to do. It's like I was making God um, conform to what I wanted to do, being disobedient. And he even covered me in me asking him to get me out of a situation that I got myself into. And so did it shoot my self-esteem? It was humbling, but it was also reaffirming. It strengthened my esteem. It made me um, more confident in the fact that, you know, if I trust God to help me redefine what it is I want for my life, and even as I'm still redefining, and even as I'm still, and always asking him to direct my path, he... <laughs> Uh, silly me okay i just checked my phone we're gonna have to do a part two of this because a lot of what jordan said got cut off i ran out of storage space my fault um but i will drop all of her links below um to her youtube her instagram her blog jordan riles um let us know what you guys want us to talk about any other topics us i will catch y'all on the next video